You run, you ride, you drive, or even if you fly, there is a certain amount of air resistance that you encounter unless you are submerged underwater or if you are in space. So in today's episode of It's Different in Future, let's talk about aerodynamics and what it holds in future for us. In 1726, Sir Isaac Newton was the first to put a theory across where he said that air would create resistance when an object was moving through it, which was later proved. But work on aerodynamics didn't really pick up until the 19th century. Sir George Cayley, he was the first one to design an aircraft wing with respect to aerodynamics in 1979. Before that, there were very primitive methods that we used to design vehicles. Let's take the auto industry for instance. When I talk about automobiles, even if you consider Ford's Model T which was launched in 1902, was quite boxy in shape. And not just that, any other car or trucks during that era were quite boxy. They were not thought of with aerodynamics in play. But it was in the late 1920s and early 1930s when automobile manufacturers manufacturers really started to pay attention to how the air was flowing over their vehicles and that's when they started to design vehicles which were more streamlined. The 1941 Chrysler Thunderbolt was dubbed as the car of the future not because it had advanced technology but it was because of the way the car looked. It was more streamlined as compared to any other car before its era and that's why the revolution around streamlining cars with respect to aerodynamics started. It was in 1901 that the Wright brothers tested how air flows around an object in the wind tunnel. They did not have a full-size wind tunnel, they designed a small miniaturized wind tunnel and they would test out the flow of air around these objects. It was in 1901 that they started testing the airflow and in 1903 they achieved successful flight in the right flyer. But then this design is what automobile manufacturers was to use. They used to use smaller wind tunnels and scale models of their prototype cars in the wind tunnel. That's how they would design cars initially. Now you have full-size wind tunnels. So. It's been scaled up, but there are much more advances that have come into aerodynamics because of the same. Ahead of Lewis Hamilton, Valtteri Bottas on the inside as well. Bottas might have a better line through and he's been... In a car, the airflow around the car determines how fast the car is going to be, how good it's going to be around handling high speed turns and how efficient it's going to be. Bad airflow around the car will only lead to drag and with drag, you can't really achieve the speeds that you're aiming for. And if you want those speeds, you'll have to pump in more fuel so it makes it less efficient. And with drag, you also hamper the handling of car at high speed turns. So aerodynamics plays a very crucial role when you want to design a car which is faster, turns harder and is much more efficient. Aerodynamics is also very important to keep the car plant to the road. Now that is called downforce. Now downforce is determined by the speed that the car carries when it's running through air. When the car is actually cutting through air at high speeds, there is air flowing over the car, but there's also air flowing underneath the car. And if you remember, there are wings on the side of an aircraft. The purpose of them is to create lift. In this case, when a car is running at high speeds, there's also lift being created underneath the car. So if your aerodynamics is not managed on the top or there's not enough downforce, the car will take off. And to understand this, let's look at the world of Formula One. It slides out and away we go. It's a good reaction from Charles Leclerc. It's a better reaction. A Formula One car is quite similar to an aircraft. At least the principles that they use, they're quite similar, but they're opposite. Aircraft uses aerodynamics to stay up in flight. On the other hand, a Formula One car uses the same principles, but uses lift in the opposite way. It uses air to create downforce to keep itself planted on the road. This is done by the help of two wings on and Formula 1 car. There is a front wing and there's a rear wing. Both of these create enough downforce that a Formula 1 car can actually run upside down on a tunnel at good speeds. That's the amount of downforce a car creates. Now the downforce created by a Formula 1 vary with respect to different variables. For instance, if it's at lower speeds, the wings on the front and the back are tilted upwards to create more downforce so that the car can have better traction going around corners. But if it's a straight line, the wings on the front and back create lesser downforce so that the car creates less drag and can achieve higher speeds. There are also tunnels on the side of the Formula 1 car which channel the air throughout the car, cooling the engine and also streamline the car even further. And there are diffusers placed at the rear of the car underneath the bottom so that the air which is flowing underneath the car does not create too much of turbulence when it's exiting out from the car. For your reference, a drag coefficient of a Formula car is 0.7 CD. That's quite less. If you think that's impressive, the drag coefficient coefficient of a current generation of street legal cars is even less as compared to a Formula 1 
forecast. But what about the future of aerodynamics? Now, attempts have been made on both land and the air to have much more studies going into aerodynamics so that more and more efficient and aerodynamic vehicles can be created. But a recently released report from Cambridge suggests that investments into aerodynamics have somewhat of a decline because most of the manufacturers or investors feel that we have somehow achieved a pinnacle of aerodynamics. But Cambridge also says that air travel is going to increase by around 30 times in the next 10 years to come. Hence, advancement in the aerodynamics is going to play a vital role in aviation. With respect to what's happening on land, we have limitations on land with respect to how we can manage aerodynamics. Is because there is a, another factor that comes into play, which is the resistance created by ground. Elon Musk is leading here with his Hyperloop program where he claims that his Hyperloop program, which is going to be using a compressed air tube to transport people from one end to another. Because it's a compressed air tube, there's going to be no air resistance and because of which this capsule, which is going to be traveling in the Hyperloop, can reach speeds up to 1,100 kilometers. There are some researchers or radical research groups who are saying that they are investigating anti-gravity. With the help of anti-gravity, you will not have gravitational forces working on the vehicle which is trying to fight gravity. Even the Japanese are saying that they are currently researching on anti-gravity or gravitational engine which will help the train reach from Earth to Moon and even to Mars with the help of this technology. Now, this is yet to come but this is still very promising. Maybe this is just something that we need in the future which will help us travel from one place to another much more efficiently because greener earth is what we are all working towards. This is Aurelius from Mashable India signing off.